Professor Harari, uh, well, once again, welcome to Baku, welcome to Azerbaijan. Uh, you were a keynote speaker at the opening ceremony of the 74th International Astronautical Congress here in Baku. And this Congress brings together space enthusiasts, researchers, scientists, students, uh, uh, companies that are involved in space exploration. Uh, I'm curious, when you were a kid, did you ever dream becoming an astronaut? Um, no, no, not really. <laughs> I know that many kids dream of being astronauts. I was always more interested in inner space than outer space. I guess I'm an introvert. And I think maybe the greatest mystery in the universe is, is right here. How the mind works. How consciousness works. So um, I'm more of a psychonaut, as they call it, than an astronaut. Still on the topic of space, um Quite exciting times. Russia, India sending their um, equipment to the moon. Uh, United States um, uh, launching the so-called Artemis program, which plans to bring, once again, human being back to the moon. Um, and this program is actually is a good example of global collaboration. Uh, Germany, Japan, Canada, Israel, obviously the United States and Italy are collaborating. So my question to you is, can this program be a showcase uh, for the power of diversity and collaboration in tackling the global challenges? Yes, I mean, hopefully we'll see more of this kind of cooperation on Earth and not just in outer space, because we need it most on Earth. One of the you know, criticisms of the space race in uh, the, the previous age during the Cold War was that it was fueled to some extent by despair about planet Earth. That people felt, you know, this planet is over, hum humans are going to destroy each other, so maybe we need to explore space in order to save human civilization elsewhere. And some people fear that this is happening again, that because of climate change, because of rising global tensions and maybe a new Cold War, uh, human existence or, uh, on Earth is again in danger so we need to speed up the exploration and colonization of other planets. Now, I'm not against exploring space, of course, but it should be very clear to everyone that the future of human civilization, at least for the coming decades and generations, is, is on this planet. It is extremely difficult to keep human beings alive in outer space or on other planets. So yes, we should explore other planets, but not at the expense of this one. And we need to make sure that all these countries can cooperate here on Earth to deal with problems like climate change. Otherwise, there will be no future for human civilization anywhere. Speaking about cooperation and bringing us back to Earth, um, Azerbaijan, and this is actually also kind of an historical perspective, Azerbaijan is home to approximately 10,000 people of Jewish uh, descent. The so-called mountainous Jews. And they've been living here, uh, according to um, sort of historical uh, facts, over uh, 15 centuries. Now, Azerbaijan is a predominantly Muslim state and has been, uh, Islam has been in Azerbaijan since almost 7th century. Um, to us, it's a, a great, even in a paradoxical example of coexistence of Jews and Muslims under one roof for centuries and existing and coexisting peacefully, which I should underline, over the many, many, as you can imagine, uh, historical situations when situations were quite sort of not as good for, 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 the, for the population. Uh, and, and to me, it's, it's, it's a great example, but also a question. How can we repeat or how can we ensure that the sort of the religious tolerance or, or national identities can actually be, a, can exist in this kind of peaceful environment? What should be clear is that violence ultimately is our decision. That some people think that violence is like a law of nature, that there is always the same level of violence between people. And this is absolutely not true. That every war, every oppression, every persecution is ultimately the result of human decisions. Human decisions not just at one moment, but over generations. No, there is an imbalance between peace and war. To have peace, you need to invest in building trust over years, decades, generations. You have to again and again choose peace 
You have to plant seeds of peace so there will be peace in the future. War, on the other hand, can happen in one moment. You can shatter trust that was built over generations in, in a single decision. And even when this happens, then our job is to tr start rebuilding. You know, um, Azerbaijan has been through difficult times in the past. Now it's in a much stronger position. Um, when you become more powerful, you should also have more responsibility. So I, I think, and the Azeri people have shown it in the past, like with the Jewish population, that they can be tolerant and uh, they can plant seeds of peace. And even if this is difficult, these are the best seeds to plant. Um, because ultimately, the most important asset in the world in history is trust between people. When you have hatred between neighbors, then even if you are the strongest neighbor in the neighborhood, your life will still be miserable. Maybe uh, sort of jumping into a little bit into the future, We've talked about the past and we've talked about the space. You know, I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a father of two. And one of my kids is, in a few years, he's going to enter that age when he finishes school and he needs to choose a university. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, uh, I'm not sure uh, what advice I can give him. Uh, you know, you look at all this World Economic Forum and different kind of, you know, uh, agencies that provide forecasts. You know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, coding, and what kind of skills are required. But as someone who has uh, been quite vocal on the future of humanity, what would be your recommendation to me as a parent that I can share with my kid? First of all, it's good that you're not sure what advice to give your kids, because we are at a moment where we are not sure that, in fact, nobody has any idea how the job market would look like in 20 years or even in 10 years. We know that AI is coming, it's already here. We know it will change dramatically. The job market, lots of jobs will disappear, new jobs will emerge, we are not sure which jobs. So anyone who is certain, oh, people will need this skill, like people who say, okay, teach your kids to be computer scientists, how to write code. This is very dangerous. In 10 years, maybe AI writes code better than any human being. So your, your, your son or your daughter could spend years learning to code. And when they come, come to the job market, people say, we don't need you anymore. We have AI. So the best thing to invest in is not a specific limited skill, but the ability to keep learning and changing again and again, because we do know that the world will not change just once. We are entering a very fluid era in history and in the economy. To stay relevant, people will have to keep learning and changing and reinventing themselves again and again. So for this, again, the most important skill is to keep learning and changing throughout your life. And for this, you need high emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is what makes it possible for people to deal with the unknown, to deal with doubts, to keep changing. You know, change means letting go of something you know, like I sit now comfortably here, and to change I need to get up, walk, go somewhere else. And this thing, of course, it, it demands physical skill, but it demands mental flexibility. And I think this is the most important thing to invest right now in the education of the young generation. Actually, we, we've spoken about your advice to younger generation, and it almost, I can almost see another question in my mind, which is, of course, more macro question. Countries, advice to countries. Now, Azerbaijan is an example of a small country. 10 million people population, relatively small geographical area. Uh, rich in energy resources, but actually nowadays tries to shift from resource-rich economy into technology-driven economy, at least as an, as an intention for the future. But we all understand that in the race for being the most technological country in the world, small countries probably stand a little chance compared to bigger powers. But there must be a way out, or there must be a way. What would be your overall sort of vision, what is the place for small countries? 
And a small country like Azerbaijan cannot hope to compete alone against the USA or against China, who are leading the AI race. Um, to avoid a repetition of the, you know, the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, when a few countries industrialized first, became industrial superpowers, and then conquered and exploited the rest of the world, to avoid a repeat of this scenario, the smaller countries need to come together because only there is safety in numbers. You know, the first rule of every empire is divide and rule. For a big, powerful country, if it is able to divide the smaller countries, make them fight against themselves, this is the road to empire. If the smaller countries are able to keep a common front, they are in a much better bargaining position to uh, either develop their own technology or at least to regulate and put some controls on the technologies coming from the big countries. Again, just think what would be the situation of Azerbaijan in 20 years if all the information on every Azeri citizen from the humblest person to the president, to the military officers, to the journalists, the judges, all the information on all of them is held by some superpower, maybe in China, maybe in Russia, maybe in the United States. Even if there are no foreign soldiers on Azeri soil, in this situation, it has become what is known as a data colony. You know, in the 19th century, to conquer a country, you needed to send the soldiers in. In the 21st century, to control a country, make it a colony, you just need to take the data out. If all the information is somewhere else, and another country controls the information system, and also by that also control, in a way, people's minds, what they think, they don't need to send the soldiers in. So again, for a small country to prevent this scenario by itself, it's very difficult. But if a lot of small countries unite, then they have a chance to, be, uh, to balance the power of the big fish. So <clears throat> you, you talked about um, the difference between countries. Again, I, I want to sort of go back to you as a historian and to hear your perspective on one question which to me has been widely discussed in, in over centuries, the role of the individual in, in history. In other words, uh, there have been examples, uh, many examples, you know, people like Nelson Mandela, Abraham Lincoln, Peter the Great, uh, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who um, you know, by themselves sort of embody the rise of the nation or embody the huge leap in the development of a certain nation. But at the same time, there are views that there are very, very few things that, that individuals can do. It's really the common knowledge and, and anything else. And again, as a historian, which camp do you support? Well, I think it's like the imbalance of war and peace it's the same type of imbalance. A single person can make a big disaster, but a single person cannot by himself or herself uh, make a big positive leap forward. You know, to uh, um, build a social movement, for instance, that improves people's lives, you need cooperation between many, many people. Just a decision of a leader is not enough. I often, when people ask me, how can I, as a simple individual, make a change in the world? So I, I told them, join an organization. 50 people working together in an organization can make a much, much bigger change in the world than 500 individuals each trying to do their own thing. This goes back to the, also to the previous question. This is why every empire is built on divide and rule. That if people fight among themselves, or if small countries fight among themselves, this gives the opportunity for the empire to come in and take over. You know, if you look a hundred years back after the Bolshevik Revolution, when the Russian Empire collapsed, so what enabled basically the Soviets to come in and conquer Azerbaijan and Armenia and Georgia and incorporate them back into a new Russian Empire that the local people fought among themselves so much that they couldn't resist the new Russian-Soviet invasion. And maybe to just um, summarize and with one final question, and I think this, this, this point um, comes up quite often in your, in your speeches, the issue of trust. Yes. Uh, I think you've alluded to it, you know, the need for cooperation, etc. But, but it, it's almost inevitable that the question comes up that 
where there is no trust, how do you cooperate? And maybe it's a catch-22, I mean, but in a sense, what would be your vision of restoring trust in society among humans and institutions? Yes, I mean, again, it's a vicious circle. You don't have trust, so uh, um, you, you, you just fight the other people around you, then there is no trust, and, and it goes on like that. And it's often the responsibility of the more powerful actors to take a risk. That, you know, when you're very, very weak and you're threatened, then you can't take any risks. But when you're stronger, then you can take a risk. Okay, I'll try to start building trust. It could backfire. I could kind of expose myself, but I'm strong enough, I'm sure, that I, I, I will be able to handle it. So let's try. And, um, you know, you saw after the First World War that the victors had no trust in Germany and they just tried to put Germany down. And in the end, they got the Second World War. After the Second World War, they tried something different. Then, okay, after all the terrible things that the Germans did, let's, uh, uh, let's try to work with them. And, you know, you had this uh, initiative of the steel and coal uh, uh, union, which eventually became the European Union. And you look at the level of trust that, say, France and Germany have to, between them today. And this is the basis of the prosperity of Europe in recent decades, is that the French and Germans and, and Dutch and Poles trust each other. Now, how, after the horrors of the, of the Nazi regime and the Second World War, how did we reach a situation when French and Germans and Poles trust each other? It was not easy. It took decades, but ultimately it was because the victors uh, were willing to take some risks. I often say that we need to learn history, not in order to just remember the past, and not in order to repeat the past, but in order to liberate ourselves from the past. That whatever our ancestors did, we don't have to repeat it. We can behave differently. History is not our destiny. It's in the past. The most dangerous leaders are the leaders who try to lead their countries back. Like, we need to go back to some place we have been before. You can never go back. The really uh, 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 good leaders in history are those who have a real vision for the future. Whatever happened in the past, we cannot change that. But we can change the future. The future is in our hands. And I think that's a great summary for our interview. The future is in our hands and actually there is a hope for the, for the humanity and for the future if we take it seriously and if we actually do everything to unite and to cooperate for the common good. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.